Hey guys, what's up and welcome back to The Rocket Sub. My name is Philip and today we've got quite a journey ahead of us. A journey through the world of physics trying to figure out why staging events are a thing in rocketry. Over the course of the first seven decades of space exploration, there have been dozens if not hundreds of unique rocket designs. There have been traditional designs like the Titan or Atlas series ICBM derived launch vehicles, larger ones such as the Saturn V or more unusual vehicles such as the Shuttle. From time to time even some abominations like the Ares I existed and found their place in the history books of spaceflight. Look at all these different designs, it may be hard to find even a single thing they all share, apart from being rockets in the first place. But wait a minute, there's something else. When watching a rocket launch, such as the almost weekly Starlink missions, you will certainly notice that every single rocket does a special thing during ascent, stage separation. The first stage of a vehicle is separated from the rest and falls back down to Earth. Then the second stage ignites and continues the payload's way to space. And that is what every single launch vehicle ever flown to space has in common. They all were multi-stage vehicles. The only exceptions here are some sketchy single-stage experimental vehicles like the DCX, but they never made it to space. If staging events are the one thing uniting all of our rockets, they must serve some very important purpose, or do they? In 1903, a Russian physicist and rocket science pioneer with the name of Konstantin Tsiolkovsky published a work including a formula that might be the most important piece of physics in the history of spaceflight. Known as Tchaikovsky's rocket equation, it describes the velocity change a launch vehicle can achieve while using a certain amount of propellant. The change in velocity, also known as delta v, equals the product of the effective exhaust velocity and the natural logarithmic function of the vehicle's mass ratio. Sounds complicated, but trust me, it isn't. There are multiple weird expressions in this equation that we can express by using more familiar terms. The effective exhaust velocity, for example, is the velocity at which the engine's exhaust leaves the nozzle, as the name suggests. This value can be calculated by multiplying the specific impulse of the engine with standard gravity. Since specific impulse, the unit in which aerospace engineers measure efficiency is defined as the time an engine is capable of accelerating a mass of 1 kg with 1 g or 9.81 meters per second squared, it is given in seconds a unit of time. When multiplied with standard gravity, given in meters per second squared, they cancel out a few parameters and leave a velocity in meters per second. It may appear a bit weird that engine efficiency times gravity equals velocity, but the maths behind it works out. The other factor in Tchaikovsky's rocket equation is the natural logarithmic function of the vehicle's mass ratio. In the unlikely case that you aren't familiar with the natural logarithm, that's just a normal logarithm with Euler's number as its base. But the way more complicated term here is the so-called mass ratio. It expresses the ratio between the dry weight of the rocket and the total lift of weight, including propellant. It also equals 1 minus the mass fraction, which is a more common term which expresses the ratio between the propellant mass and the lift of weight of the vehicle. If we sum that up, the rocket equation states that delta v, or change in velocity expressed in meters per second, equals the product of a standard gravity given in meters per second squared and specific impulse in seconds times the natural logarithmic function of wet mass over dry mass, both given in kilograms so the units cancel each other out, leaving delta v to be given in meters per second. Now that we know how Tchaikovsky's rocket equation works, we can start to play around with it. 
there are generally two ways to solve this equation. Either you figure out the maximum amount of delta v generated by a given vehicle, or you estimate how much propellant a certain vehicle is going to need to achieve a certain amount of delta v. To do that, we have to isolate the wet mass of the vehicle on one side of the equation. To get to low Earth orbit, a delta v of somewhere between 9.3 to 10 km per second is required. That is a bit higher than the actual orbital velocity of about 7.8 km per second, since we have to fight gravity all the way to space, a loss also known as gravity drag or gravity loss. But for the required propellant mass, we have to know our vehicle's dry mass or the equation is going to be unsolvable. So what we do is add up the fixed mass of the vehicle, its maximum payload mass, all the non-tank structures and avionics. Now we have to solve the equation to get our wet mass. In this case, I just assumed these values for exemplary vehicle. So now that we know how much propellant we need, we have to build our tanks around it. For that, we need to know how much mass of steel or other material is needed to contain a certain amount of fuel. Assuming that we need about 1 ton of material per 50 tons of propellant, we get a provisional wet mass of 724 tons. At last, we need to equip our rocket with some engines. In this example, I have chosen the SpaceX Merlin engine to power our rocket. Since the Merlin has a power output of about 900 kN, we need 9 engines to manage a takeoff. But now we have a slight problem. These newly added engines and fuel tanks raise the dry mass of our vehicle dramatically, which means that we lose quite a bit of delta V and can't get to orbit anymore. To counteract this, we have two possibilities. Either we reduce the amount of payload we can take to orbit, something that you don't really want at all, or we add more fuel. But by adding more fuel, our takeoff weight increases to 1,293 tons, so we need way more engines. At least 15, in fact. And we've got the exact same problem, again. Eventually, we will get to a point where our required delta V is achievable without cutting payload mass. But at that point, the amount of propellant we have to carry around is extremely high. In fact, the propellant mass makes up almost 90% of the total lift of weight already. And now is the point at which the values I chose for the different parameters of our exemplary rocket come into play. It is no coincidence that the engine powering our vehicle is the Merlin and that our payload mass is exactly 22.8 tons. That's the maximum payload mass of the Falcon 9 when expanded. So since we have the same payload capacity and the same engines as a Falcon 9, it is fair to see how much the propellant mass of our vehicle differs from the Falcon 9's. Well, our vehicle weighs more than twice the Falcon 9 and we still have too little engine power to take off, meaning it's going to be even worse. Solving the rocket equation appears almost impossible, and if you get a solution, it isn't what you wanted. But there has to be a better way to build a rocket than what we just calculated, right? Well, our exemplary rocket is what we know as an SSTO, a rocket that has only one stage to get to orbit. But what happens if we just split our rockets in two stages, firing in order? Well, the delta V requirement for either of the stages is lowered dramatically. The first stage typically has a delta V requirement of just below 5 km per second, despite having an extremely high dry mass, including the payload and the entire second stage with its propellant. That makes the entire thing already much better. Once the first stage has burned out, it is simply ditched to reduce the dry mass that the second stage carries. Therefore, the second stage has a lower delta V requirement of also about 5 km per second and carries a lower dry mass around. Additionally, second stages feature separate engines which can be adapted for operating purely in a vacuum of space, granting an enormous boost in specific impulse. By introducing a stage in the event, we can minimize the amount of required propellant and increase the efficiency of our rocket dramatically. And in reality, the benefits of having multiple stages are even more extreme. The target delta V we used in our example was required impulse for orbital insertion. 
but that would limit the altitude of the achievable orbit with maximum payload on board and at the same time leave no fuel for deorbiting the empty rocket. Therefore, most rockets have a higher delta V budget of 12 or sometimes even more kilometers per second and the efficiency of single stage rockets is even worse in this case. So now we know why we need staging, but what we don't know yet is how we need to do it. A typical staging event is divided in three phases. At first, we have to shut down the engines of the first stage to stop it from accelerating any further. This is also known as the main engine cutoff or just MECO. After MECO, the burnt out stage separates from the upper stages and moves away from the rest of the rocket before performing the third phase, the startup of the new engines. The first phase is probably the most straightforward one. Shutting down the main engines before stage separation is something every single rocket ever flown did, with only two exceptions. The space shuttle and most likely its Soviet counterpart, the Buran. These crafts didn't have real stages, since the first stage was somewhat replaced with large boosters which separate while the engines of the core stage were still running as usual for booster separation events. That same principle also applies for NASA's upcoming SLS launch vehicle. There are two simple reasons for shutting down the engines before stage separation. Obviously, we have not much fuel left in the first stage at MECO so that the engines would burn out either way, so we just shut them down in a controlled manner. On the other hand, we need to stop the first stage from accelerating further or this will happen. Not shutting down the engines in time poses a threat to the two stages colliding during separation. Since the second stage isn't able to properly accelerate for a short period of time, the first stage still running would just accelerate into the second stage as it happened on the third flight of SpaceX Falcon 1. The actual separation event can be accomplished through multiple ways. To get the upper stages away from the old stage, they have to be accelerated slightly to gain a higher impulse than the burned out stage. To get this small boost, pusher systems of all kinds are used. They either work by exploding tiny sets of pyrotechnics, pushing the upper stages away with a hydraulic system, or firing small cold gas RCS thrusters. There also are some more special variants like igniting the second stage engine while still being attached to the first stage, like many Soviet rockets did it including, for example, the Soyuz or the N1 moon rocket. Because of this, the stages of many old Soviet launchers are connected by a grid instead of metal sheets to allow the exhaust of the newly lit stage to escape out of the interstage. Another approach would be the spin separation said to be featured on Starship. During MECO, the rocket starts to spin vertically, it pitches up. Due to the conservation of angular momentum, the upper stage just drifts away from the empty stage without any further forces being applied. But before pulling the upper stages away from the lower stage, the two segments of the rocket have to be unlatched from each other. To release the upper stages, the part that attaches them to the rest of the rocket has to be removed. On most expendable vehicles of the past, this task was fulfilled by pyrotechnic fasteners special bolts which are split in half when a current is injected into them. For reusable vehicles that isn't a viable option, so they normally use some kind of hydraulic piston system to release the second stage. On some vehicles the payload fairing is not attached to the uppermost stage, but to the interstage beneath it. In this case the fairing has to separate before the two stages, so they are out of the way for a second engine startup. Why that is important was clearly visible on Astra's Elana 41 mission when one of the fairing halves didn't separate properly and stayed attached to interstage which led the second stage to crash into the fairing and spin out of control. The rocket literally managed to fly into itself. Once the separation is conducted and the upper stage is far enough from the lower stage, 
the new engine is lit up and the upper stage continues its way to orbit. Such staging events typically happen once or twice during ascent, varying from vehicle to vehicle. All of that seems pretty neat, doesn't it? But like it always is in rocketry, there are some disadvantages to staging events. To explain what disadvantages staging events hold, we have to go back to Tchaikovsky's rocket equation. There is something I didn't mention about what introducing a staging event does to this beautiful equation. Apart from lowering the delta v requirement and the required propellant load, staging events increase the dry mass of the rocket. After all, the equipment needed to accomplish staging as well as the additional engines weighed a lot. Despite the additional weight, a melted state rocket is still far more efficient than SSTO vehicles. But by adding more and more staging events, this mass deficit begins to grow. Therefore, a rocket with three, four or even more stages is just highly inefficient and just not feasible. The absolute highest amount of stages ever flown in any vehicle was four, and that only makes sense when the upper stages have an extremely high ISP. But despite that, the most commonly used and also ideal amount of stages is, depending on application, two or three. Low Earth orbit vehicles like the Falcon 9 are typically two-stage rockets and sometimes use additional boosters, making them two-and-a-half-stage vehicles, as seen on the Falcon Heavy or the Atlas V, for example. When aiming for translunar injections or interplanetary journeys, three-stage vehicles are optimal, but two-stage vehicles aren't that much worse. Introducing more staging events also poses a higher risk of the mission failing. As the two cases I've already shown demonstrated, staging events can fail in many ways. Not separating the stages properly, having too much impulse in a lower stage or just not jettisoning the fairings in time can all lead to the loss of the vehicle. Obviously, the more staging events we introduce, the higher is the probability of a failed staging. By reducing the amount of staging events, we can find a compromise between minimal risk of failure and optimal efficiency. But apart from these two things, there aren't any real disadvantages to staging events. In general, this is all theoretical since there are no five stage rockets out there and failed staging events are, despite higher risk, pretty rare. beginning of the video, we established the term of an SSTO, a vehicle able to reach orbit without having multiple stages. As we learned from examining Tchaikovsky's rocket equation, these SSTOs aren't efficient at all. They require more fuel and have to be pretty large to even work out. All in all, they don't appear to be viable for space travel. Or are they? Not everything about SSTOs is impossible or inefficient. After all, there have been multiple attempts to make SSTOs work, despite those not being very successful. One thing, almost every single SSTO concept incorporated was full reusability. Since no staging events happen, the rocket stays intact for the entire mission duration. The best example for such a craft was the Venture Star a fully reusable shuttle replacement that was worked on between the early 90s and 2001. The Venture Star was a lifting body design vehicle that lifted off vertically and landed horizontally, just like the Space Shuttle. But other than the shuttle, the Venture Star had all of its hydrogen fuel and engines on board, so it didn't need any additional hardware. It also was compatible with existing infrastructure and had a decent payload mass of about 20 tons, and the best part, its launch cost was destined to be less than 10% of a shuttle launch. So why don't we have a Venture Star? Well, to make such a craft possible, we need a few pieces of really advanced technology. 
Among them are extremely lightweight materials. Reducing a dry mass of an SSTO is really important to reduce propellant and manufacturing costs. But apart from being lightweight, such materials must maintain their strength even at cryogenic as well as re-entry temperatures, which is an immense difference in condition. Best suited for this job are special carbon composites and we have already built rockets from this stuff. The only problem is that these composites are expensive to manufacture and unfortunately for the Venture Star, they weren't available back then. Secondly, we need highly specialized engines that are able to operate at all altitudes with decent efficiency. When sticking to classic bell nozzles, we would need at least two separate sets of engines to achieve a decent ISP in vacuum. But adding more engines catapults the dry mass to infinity, so that isn't a viable option. But there is a special kind of engine that can fix this problem. The Aerospike. Aerospike engines point the exhaust of multiple combustion chambers at a central spike. By effectively using ambient air as their nozzle, aerospikes are able to maintain a similar ISV at all altitudes. The only problem? Aerospike engines like the XRS2200 developed for the Venture Star are insanely complex and hard to cool. As of today, an aerospike has yet to fly. And at last, reusable SSTO vehicles require advanced heat shields with lightweight and extremely high travel capacity. Such shields exist, but the only one used was the shield on the shuttle. And as you know, the shuttle's heat tiles weren't that reusable. In the end, technology readiness was what led the Venture Star program to its cancellation. We'll never know if the concept would have actually worked out. However, it was one of the most promising SSTO proposals. But there may even be a better way to build an SSTO. Almost every liquid fuel rocket engine uses liquid oxygen as its oxidizer. Depending on what kind of fuel is used, the oxygen makes up more than two thirds of the propellant's total mass. The question is, do we have to carry all of our oxygen around on board our vehicle? Well, turns out, we don't. The atmosphere of our home planet is already full of oxygen. In fact, it makes up 21% of the air around us. So what if we use this oxygen for our engines during the first minutes of flight? Enter the Sabre, a liquid-fueled, air-breathing rocket engine concept that is able to burn both atmospheric and cryogenic oxygen, effectively a jet engine and rocket engine in one. The Sabre was designed for a space plane concept called the Skylon, which takes off and lands like an airliner. From takeoff on a runway up to the higher atmosphere, the Sabre engines would work in a similar fashion to jet engines, burning atmospheric oxygen and liquid hydrogen from its tanks. Once Skylon enters the higher layers of the atmosphere, the air around isn't dense enough to feed oxygen to the engines anymore. Therefore, the oxygen supply is switched to drawing liquid oxygen from internal tanks. By using the air around us as propellant, the Sabre engine enables Skylon to carry much less weight around and maximize engine efficiency during the first few minutes of flight. Despite the horizontal takeoff and ascent phase requiring more delta V than usual, this approach is actually viable. The only real problem for space plane concepts like the Skylon isn't efficiency or technology readiness, but advancement in rocket reusability. Partially and fully reusable multi-stage vehicles such as the Falcon 9, Rocket Lab's Neutron or Starship make a reusable space plane almost useless. Development and operational costs of such vehicles are just too high to keep up with their multi-stage counterparts, at least for now. By analyzing the good old rocket equation, it becomes pretty apparent why we fly to space and multi-stage vehicles exclusively. Single stage to orbit is only viable when executed perfectly and with some cheats like the Sabre engine or aerospikes. 
But even if we manage to get SSTOs working with acceptable efficiency, multi-stage rockets will probably always outmatch any SSTO. Here on Earth, gravity is just a bit too strong to make SSTOs a competitive option. And that is why we maybe won't ever see an SSTO here on Earth unless we invent some crazy technology like nuclear fusion engines. Over the decades, many SSTO designs were proposed, but all of them either remained pure imagination or turned out to be too complicated to build. As of today, just a few concepts haven't been cancelled, among them the Skylon spaceplane. Although Skylon may look promising, its future is uncertain, not just because of multi-stage competition, but also due to it being developed by the British who are famous for cancelling promising programs. But there is one way in which we may actually see SSTOs fly in the future, just not here on Earth. In the very near future, humanity will begin expanding toward the Moon and Mars, where surface gravity is far lower than here on Earth. The vehicles, which will be bringing astronauts and rock samples from their surfaces to space, are most likely going to be SSEOs, since the smaller Delta V requirements enables SSTOs to match multi-stage vehicles on these bodies. In fact, the only vehicle to have ever taken off from another celestial body, the ascent element of the Apollo lander, was an SSTO. But other than ascent vehicles from lunar and Martian missions, single-stage to orbit concepts may very well remain wet dreams of some aerospace engineers. Multi-state rockets are and will always be the simplest and easiest way to get to space. And that's it on why rockets do staging events and why SSTOs aren't a thing. Let me know in the comments whether you believe that we will ever see an SSTO or not, and if you enjoyed the video, which I really hope you did, why don't you hit the like button and subscribe to the Rocket Tab. Thank you if you do so. We see ourselves in the next video, and until then, I'm out. Cheers!